Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. First up, Ian chats with Tasha of Project Mayday, a harm reduction project operating in so-called West Virginia. They discuss harm reduction strategies and the political framework of their approach to mutual aid. The conversation also touches upon coexisting in the public health and nonprofit space without compromising their radical values, and some of the many ways that drug policy and pharmaceutical marketing affected people who use drugs. Then I spoke with Toby from Appalachians Against Pipelines, as well as Madeline Fitch, an activist recently arrested for locking down to a drill threatening to move the Mountain Valley Pipeline through Peters Mountain at Jefferson National Forest. We talked about the recent Days of Solidarity, direct actions against the MVP, repression of activists, and related topics. So my name is Tasha Bethrow. I am the co-founder of Project Mayday in West Virginia. We are a a peer-led grassroots mutual aid harm reduction group. And um, we just kind of get in where we fit in, basically. Um, We help out where the help is needed. And um, we just kind of do a little bit of everything from safe supplies to clothes, the hygiene, anything. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm uh, really glad to be here. Thank you. Can you give a little bit of background on Project Mayday? Um, How long have you all been around? And maybe say a little bit about um, the area in which you are organizing. Yeah, so we are organizing um, around the Charleston area here in West Virginia. I live about 20 minutes outside of Charleston, so I do a little bit of work here in my area, which is very rural. But we began a little bit over a year ago, October of 22, and came together when um, the other co-founder and I became friends uh, while I was working on another project called Unstuck Chuck which is a program that I developed where we paid participants to come help clean up litter and uh, whether it be trash litter, syringe litter, um, and uh, they could get harm reduction supplies, um, any kind of other supplies that we had at the moment. And, um, you know, and they got paid for their work. Yeah. So we met and we came to the conclusion that there were needs not being met in the community and we had the ability and the willingness to try and meet those needs for folks, um, especially in harm reduction. And so we just kind of started working together to get supplies out. And um, one thing led to another and uh, we just kind of became a little um, known on social media. And now here we are today. Okay, great. Social media is how I came to know about the project. And I think one of the most important aspects of the work you're doing, especially on social media, is um, in destigmatizing drug use. Um, Mm -hmm. It seems to me that some of the language you use to describe the people with whom you work might be different from the language used in a political or a legal or a clinical setting. Can you go into some of those differences and the reasoning for your choice of descriptors? Yeah, so it's been a process, it's it's been a personal journey as well for me in changing my language and how um, you know, we approach that destigmatization process. You know, I come from, I'm, I have lived experience, but my lived experience is over 10 years old. And I come from the abstinence only world. And so I came into harm reduction with the language of addict, addiction, uh, disease, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I was very, very locked into that mindset for a very long time. You know, so like I said, it's been a personal journey as well to break down that kind of language barrier. And so I really push that. I really think it's important because language is important. It is important because it's how we begin to fix problems. It's how we begin to look at what's really going on. And, you know, when we talk about drug use, um, you know, we use definitions that are given by people in power you know, whether it's through race, class, gender, you know, so it's these definitions that are given to people who use drugs and it's used to control them. And it's, you you know, and and however that may um, find its way. But yeah, so I, um, 
you know, one of the things that I wanted to do when we formed Project May Day was to, you know, provide a lot of education and destigmatizing in that language. And it's it's worked out pretty well. Um, you know, I've, I've really seen um, a difference in folks that I uh, communicate with a lot and just folks in general around this area. There has been quite the change in um, how we talk about people who use drugs. When you say education, is that is that sort of educate? It's that education aimed at, I guess, your client base, or is, are you are you referring to more of the public, or is it both? Yeah, we do a little bit of both. I want to, you know, our our main goal is to amplify the voices and the needs of the people who use are using drugs. Okay, and so we want to make sure first and foremost that they're getting education that they need on how to um, use safely, how to have safe sex, how to stay warm in the winter, you know, whatever it is to reduce any kind of risks involved in what's going on. Um, And then, of course, educating the public is important because that's how we get support for harm reduction. And that's how we get support for people who use drugs. And so, you know, people, they don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, I've... I feel like it's important for us to educate them to the best of our ability. And, you know, what they do with that is, you know, out of our control once they have that information. But, you know, at least we could say we did our due diligence. And um, and I see it as a way to also support the people that we are helping. So, Sure. Is there a philosophical, political, or other kind of basis for the type of harm reduction in which May Day engages? Um, are you working from some kind of a playbook? And um, would you say that your approach is in keeping with current uh, public health guidelines, I guess? Yeah, so I guess as far as like within public health guidelines, you know, yeah, one of our main goals is to keep folks who are using drugs safe and healthy, you know, and help reduce harms that are associated with illicit drug use, such as infectious disease and overdose. And, you know, so, so yeah, that our methods do fall within that framework. And, and outside of that, I like to think that we kind of, you know, it's difficult to claim something, you know, but I guess we, if we had to fall into one, it would be more of like an anarchist communist kind of framework. And, you know, we don't have any kind of hierarchy. You know, membership is very fluid. Everyone has a say, um, you know, and it's just very equitable within the group. And it is, it's run by people who use drugs. It's formed by people who use drugs. And when it comes to how we um, implement our methods, it's very community-based. We share resources and we take you know, we try to take the power from the institutions and give it back to the people. Do you find that there are gaps and blind spots in the way the institutions communicate and or um, work with the communities with whom you work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Not only do like government institutions, like government agencies, but Um, service providers, nonprofits, you know, a lot of them work in silos. And when it comes to communicating with people that they serve, it's very, very, uh, I'm not sure it's, um, there's not much effort, I guess, put forth. And um, there's, there's a lot of failure when it comes to connecting with the community. And a lot of a lot of needs are not being met because of that. Um, A lot of folks feel like um, they have nowhere to go. And, you know, and that that was one of the things that motivated us to not only form, but to keep going. Um, So, so yeah, yeah, there's very, very, very much. So there's a lot of gaps. Do you share space in the region with people or organizations who will help, help your population differently than May Day helps them. Um, And if that's the case, I know that you mentioned earlier, you kind of get in where you fit in, but where are you kind of rowing in the same direction and what are the points of conflict? Yeah, so we kind of 
we piggyback a lot off of them. There's another crew in Charleston uh, called SOAR. And, you know, they were one of the first more publicly known groups in Charleston. And so we collaborate a lot with them. We share space with them a lot. Um, they have a lot of, um, you know, the, the networking that we don't have. And it's been very helpful trying, you know, trying to navigate this world, you know, and, and to have their help with that. It's been very, you know, very beneficial. And we're still kind of new when it comes to sharing space. Honestly, we were going to do this health fair here in my county where it's very rural. And the health department was involved. So we thought it was a very legit event. And we initially we signed up for it until I realized where it was. And it was at one of the local churches. But it wasn't the fact that it was at a church. It was the church that spearheaded one of our um, anti-trans ordinances here in my county. Right. And so we backed out of that. We didn't want to be involved in that. And, you know, so so it is difficult, especially in this area. You know, it's a very, very red state and it's very conservative. And so to find people who, if they don't like share our same mission, that they at least share our values, you know, and that we can at least collaborate and, you know, they're not out there causing harm, especially to the people that we love and care about, you know, and many, many of the folks that we serve. So, yeah, it's, it's been a process and we're still new and navigating it. And, uh, sure. And I'm just glad that we have people to kind of help us along the way. May I ask, is there a site out of which you work or are you generally out in the streets where the, where folks are? Oh yeah, we were. It's all peer based. Um, okay. Yeah. Out. Uh, yeah. Mobile outreach. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, it seems like you engage in a few different forms of mutual aid. Can you describe the the various efforts? And um, I guess at the end of that, maybe if you could describe what you consider to be um, successful interactions or successful building of relationships, what that looks like to you? Yeah. So when I envision mutual aid, I envision, I mean, to put it simply, it's, it's us helping each other with whatever we need, you know, because where we live, we've, we've been exploited here in Appalachia, you know, since day one. And so we've had to take care of each other since day one. And so I think it's kind of, and a little bit in all of us to have that mutual aid spirit. And it's actually very easy to do here. Um, You know, it's very easy to be able to put out a mutual aid request and be like, Hey, um, we need some clothes, jackets, tents, um, sleeping bags, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You can either donate them or donate some money and we'll get it. And it's, and I mean, within a few hours we have people like, Hey, you know, we're donating money. Um, you know, or, you know, if someone like we had someone where we had to help them get their electric fixed and turn back on and it took like $2,000 and we were able to raise all that money, um, you know, to get people shelter, to get people food. Um, you know, it's just wherever the systems and the institutions are failing, that's where we try and pick it up. And there's, it's, I don't know, it's, I feel like here in Appalachia, it's like, even though we have that spirit of mutual aid, we also kind of have that spirit of like, you know, a lot of people feel like everyone should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, but it's like, it's like, dude, we don't have any boots. (laughs) you know. (laughs) And uh, so it's kind of like, we, we just, we help each other get those boots. So it's, I think it's very interesting to do mutual aid here. Like I mentioned earlier with SOAR and collaborating with them, they do a monthly mutual aid fair in Charleston. And that's where a lot of different folks come together. You have anyone from pet care to wound care. Uh, we're there and we have our variety of services. You have like sober living folks there. They're, they have dinner. I mean, anything and everything that you could think of. And we serve about anywhere from one to 200 folks a month. And it's very successful. You know, we, you know, they're still kind of working out the kinks of it and that sort of thing, you know, because Charleston's a big city. So that's not everyone's getting served, you know, it's a, it's on the opposite side of the city, but that's been a very successful uh, thing for us to do. 
and we've, you know, we've been getting a lot of um, interactions with folks and I don't know. Um, it's just, it's, it's really good to see everybody come together. So. You tend to see people month after month. Am I right? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And then we also do, you know, when we do our peer distro, um, you know, those, those folks are seen more often. So you mentioned the difficulty of wanting to kind of pull back whenever your values are not shared by the people around you. How have you, how, how in your, in your mind, have you been received by, by the community? I guess either the, the immediate community and maybe um, a little bit beyond that, have you received, you know, pushback from anybody or how does that work? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Especially where I live because it's so rural and conservative. They, even though we have a quick response team here for overdose follow-ups, they still pretend that drug use doesn't happen here and that there are no people here that use drugs. And so it's been difficult to establish ourselves here a little bit. I've done some random naloxone pop-ups, you know, like I'll just park my car in a random parking lot. And that's been well received with the couple people that have stopped and talked to me. Okay. You know, whenever we've set up at random events where you usually don't see people with naloxone, we've been well received. Um, now, granted, we also haven't really been out that long. So, you know, there, there's still plenty of time for us to get recognized. And, uh, you know, and, and hopefully it's positive. You know, we're working on a... Um, a photo essay project right now we got a grant for and we're hoping to use that to shed some positive light on harm reduction and also people who use drugs and it's a really big tool to combat the stigma that's going on um, surrounding harm reduction in west virginia i think that the average person's window into this stuff is um the media Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what, what the media gets wrong when covering drug use and harm reduction? Oh, yeah. They're fed, they, they feed off the moral panics that the politicians, um, you know, perpetuate. Uh, it's just that they, they pin, it's like a pinball machine. They just bounce off each other, you know, and they just kind of regurgitate the same shit that, you know, drugs are bad. We need to continue the war on drugs. You know, um, we get people testifying in Congress that <laughs> doesn't know anything about drug policy and basically, <sighs> you know, it's like, and I know folks have good intentions sometimes, but it really, um, it makes it look bad when harm reduction hasn't had a full chance yet. And just because we get these little snippets of opportunities to actually practice the strategy and we're facing these barriers because of prohibition. And then when we hit those barriers, Oh, harm reduction doesn't work. Oh, it's bad. Oh, you know, we need to shut down the overdose prevention centers and et cetera, et cetera. You know? Um, so the, the media perpetuates those moral panics a lot. And, um, and I mean, it's what got our syringe service program here in Charleston shut down the media was a, was a huge factor in that. Um, Just coverage on, on the news and stuff. Mm -hmm. Along with the, the mayor at the time. Yeah. They, um, they worked to get in a, I wouldn't say they worked together, but they just kind of played off each other and it just created such a problem. Um, it's what led it to shut down. This was not in the packet of questions that I gave you because mm -hmm. it happened since then. But um, I was wondering if you had anything to say and we can cut this out if you, if you want, but that recent statement that uh, Jelly Roll made, did you see that? <laughs> yeah. what do you make of something like that? Yeah, it, I, I made it a couple minutes in, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to give them a chance. You know, it's just, like I said, not everyone's caught up on the vernacular yet, you know, and I try not to hold that against people. You know, we, we have to educate first, you know, but then it started going into the same war on drugs pro you know, prohibition rhetoric that we hear all the time. And, um, and it's like, that's not going to solve the problem. That's just going to make it worse. And, um, and that's what happens too a lot with, uh, you know, when it comes to people with 
lived experience thinking that they're the experts just because they have lived experience and you know and granted it may give me some kind of privilege in the decision making process but hell like i said my lived experience is over a decade old you sure. know i kind of need to like sit aside and let someone with more recent experience step up and be able to to speak and have a role in the decision making process and i think he just set us back a lot so it's um yeah but you'll have that that's that's what happens when celebrities get called in to testify in congress <laughs> <laughs> so. Can we talk a little bit about the Free to Vote Opi- Opioids Act? Yeah. What it what it gets wrong, what it gets, if anything, right? I doubt it. Yeah. So that is the one with the prescribing with Mansion. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Mansion. He is the worst. Okay. So he came from us, <laughs> uh, from West Virginia, and yeah, he. Uh, he, uh, he is another one of those, uh, you know, the opioid crisis was caused by big pharma kind of people. And so he's going to keep pushing the, those kind of, um, those bills through thinking that it's going to fix what's going on. But, um, but as we know, it just makes it worse, um, you know, cause people are not going to be able to get what they need and they're going to continue to have to use illicit substances and it's just going to cause more. Uh, drug poisonings and overdoses. So, um, so I, I guess I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this question, but I, I guess what I'm asking: How do you think the work of May Day either coincides with or refutes the work of marketing and prescribing of drugs by the pharma industry? Where where does that where, how does that fit together? Yeah, that's that's weird because we do advocate for safe supply, you know, right. and safe supply would come from the pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I think in a perfect world, there would be better regulation on that. And, you know, we wouldn't be stuck with the big pharma that we have here in North America, you know. So, yeah, that's that's a really complicated place to be in. But. You know, and when it comes to the overprescribing, you know, we were hit super hard. I mean, um, we were among the hardest hit here in West Virginia. And, you know, and I I got caught up in it. Um, You know, it's part of my story, my experience. Um, But I also know that the prescribing of, of, of a safe supply from doctors kept me from using illicit heroin for years. And so it's... um. So, yeah, I just think it, of course, it's not going to happen under the capitalism that we are in now, but we just need better regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it, it seems like the nonprofit sector is often tasked with kind of bridging the gap between institutions and the community. Can you talk about... I guess how the nonprofit figures into your region and you know what they're doing right or wrong. Yeah, so we have most of the nonprofits that focus on substance use here in West Virginia are recovery based. So they're going to be more um, treatment oriented, sober living, peer support specialists, that sort of thing. Uh, there is one or two nonprofits that do focus more on prevention for harms caused by illicit drug use, uh, such as HIV and hepatitis. And, and then other than that, I believe there's only one nonprofit that's actually harm reduction. That's SOAR. We're not a nonprofit. Um, and we choose that uh, we don't want to be beholden by the IRS. <laughs> So, and so, yeah, it's, it's a weird landscape here. Um, you know, there's a lot of stipulations for nonprofits here, you know, especially if they get state grants, they're only allowed to help, you know, certain um, populations, you, you know, criteria and that sort of thing. So, sure. 
Uh, so yeah, that's it's it's very weird, and I guess you know when I think about it, it does create quite a quite a bunch of gaps. Um, you know, especially in the harm reduction aspect of things. Can you maybe describe a little bit um, of what you mean by you know treatment based and recovery based? And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about um, something I saw on your social media feed. Um, recovery gaslighting. What is that? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So the the nonprofit's more focused on recovery and treatment. You're gonna that's gonna be you know like your sober living houses, the peer support special specialists, those sort of agencies and nonprofits, and they're the folks that basically are assisting people that are already in some sort of recovery, and most of it's abstinence based. Um, there is a current attack on medication assisted treatment right now from the legislature they're trying to outlaw methadone right now and also when it comes to other forms of medication assisted treatment such as uh, buprenorphine um, there's a lot of stigma surrounding it as well and so um, there's this really weird dynamic when it comes to substance use here especially in West Virginia and that takes me to the recovery gaslighting so it's the term that I I don't know if I came up with it, but it's something I've thought of. Um, You know, when I was in the process of leaving NA a couple of years ago, um, you know, I was very vocal about my experience. I was very vocal about the trauma that I experienced in that decade. And I really wanted people to know about it. And I, and because I was also um, becoming introduced to other people that had a similar experience as I did. And I was, and I thought this is something that needs to be talked about more. And so after sharing that experience, you know, there was a lot of folks, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are a few folks that it's, you know, kind of similar to when you're in a relationship. It's like, well, why are you mad? Or why are you upset? Why are you depressed? You know, why are you anxious? <laughs> it's like, you know, they're, it's like, they're asking like all these things. Well, why, why, why? And then you explain to them why, but they're like, well, that didn't happen. It's not like that, you know, or you just didn't do this. You just didn't pray enough. You didn't go to enough meetings. You didn't, you know, you didn't work a strong enough program, you know, and it's like all these things. Um, It always has to come back. It always comes back to you, you know, and, um, and so, yeah, that's something that, you know, I mean, I experienced my whole time in NA, but I didn't really realize what it was until I left. And, um, and it was, and it, it it was very hurtful. You know, some of it came from people that I considered, you know, really good friends. And, um, you know, and that's something that I'm still kind of processing since, uh, since I left a couple of years ago. And so, yeah, I think it's something that a lot of us experience when we leave, you know, especially if we go into a more harm reductionist practice. So. Can you talk about, what you view as the the limitations of programs such as NA and um, abstinence-based programs, either, you know, from your own experience or just from, you know, what you've, what you've learned about this, this environment. Yeah. So, you know, the, the program of NA was very helpful to me in the beginning of my recovery. Um, It was what I needed at the time. Um, And it was what I needed for a few years. And there are some things that I do believe are beneficial. And, um, and there are some things that I still utilize. However, the limitations were very glaring to me when I was really, when I was struggling with my mental health a lot. I um, was taking some antidepressants and was just trying to get myself you know, to a place where I wasn't suicidal. And it got to a point where I started talking to people about it. And I would just keep getting this whole like, oh, we'll just go to meetings, pray about it, talk to your sponsor, blah, 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 get the pat on the back. And, um, and then I just I kept seeing my friends die. And um, I lost my one of my best friends. Um, I was actually her sponsor. And she uh, relapsed and overdosed um, alone in her bedroom at her dad's house. And, um, and that was really when things just kind of started not making sense anymore to me. Um, I started to see how folks were ashamed 
if they used and they did not feel safe enough to come back. They did not feel comfortable telling anybody what was going on. Um, you know, we had people acting like they were therapists, but they weren't, you know, people were actively um, suggesting people go off their medications. And then, you know, <laughs> when they're like suicidal, they're like, oh, well, it's OK. You know, you'll be fine. It's fine. Um, you know, and, and then just, I don't know, like, I don't know if like intellectually is the right, the right word to use, but, but in some way it just wasn't clicking anymore. You know, I just had the, the cognitive dissonance wasn't making any sense. And, and I realized how the, you know, the philosophy, um, and the ideology behind 12 steps really perpetuates war on drugs propaganda it really hurts people and it really perpetuates that, that prohibition rhetoric. Do you think that the, maybe the ubiquitousness, the, the lasting nature of, of these programs um, insulates them from constructive criticism? Absolutely. Yeah. They are hell bent on not changing. I mean, that is that is like one of their key traditions is to stay the same and not change and not be um, influenced by outside uh, factors, you know, people, institutions. And yeah, so it's um, because there is a lot that I think if they would just even update some language in their program, you know, like I think it would mean mean the world to a lot of people sure what would be the most helpful policy wise in destigmatizing drug use and aiding drug users definitely decriminalization and legalization but we know that's a long ways away you know but we can make small steps we can stop regulating syringe programs you know we can actually legalize and regulate overdose prevention centers we can fund drug user health programs and we can fund stigma campaigns, you know, to uh, to educate the public about people who use drugs. And, you know, we can actually try to collaborate and work with the recovery industry or something. You know, there has to be something to bridge that gap because it's they, they have a monopoly on things. And um, and it's going to be very, very hard to make any kind of headway without without that collaboration here, at least here in West Virginia. Um, it's just it's just how it is. It's how it's built here. Can you talk about um, what you do to combat burnout from this stuff? If anything. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, I, I guess I just kind of ride it out. OK. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I just wait till. Yeah. That's, that's really the only suggestion. I okay. have is just wait till it's over. And um, yeah, I um, try to take a couple personal mental health days. Okay. You know? Yeah. Are you the person in charge of designing the great yes. t-shirts that you guys do? Yes. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Can you point listeners to other efforts or literature that um, excite you around harm reduction, maybe other groups or, or some really uh, insightful books, anything? Uh, Podcasts, yeah, so, anything? Um, if you're new to harm reduction and you're wanting to learn more about, you know, people who use drugs and how it, you know, it's different than what you've originally thought Anything from Maya Salovitz is good. Undoing Drugs and Unbroken Brain are good books. Um, I just started reading Saving Our Own Lives. Uh, it's about liberatory harm reduction. And there's the one organization that I'd like to plug would be Remedy Alliance for the People. Um, it's because we get our naloxone from them. Underfunded programs can get free naloxone uh, from them, shipped to them, and they help provide a lot of naloxone to a lot of groups around the country. Um, but yeah, um, other than that, it's just a bunch of us tiny little groups, you know, <laughs> Okay, trying to make it. 
Can you tell people um, where they can hear what Mayday is up to and how they can help out? Yeah, uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and it's all, I believe, Project Mayday X, I believe. And then our website is MaydayX.net. And yeah, it has our links on there and everything. And um, I usually keep us pretty up to date, you know, posting things, whether if it's not educational, you know, telling folks what we're doing, what we're up to and we're asking for donations. <laughs> we'll put all that information in the show notes. Awesome. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. You take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you want to support the Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. <laughs> Welcome to Molotov Now, a podcast about taking action. In Molotov Now, we analyze and discuss news articles and stories of resistance from around the globe and connect them to our struggles here at home in Aberdeen, Washington. In the spirit of building solidarity between the rural and the urban, we hope to inspire direct action in the face of oppression and to light a fire to find each other in the darkness. Okay, so we're joined by folks involved in the struggle against the Mountain Valley Pipeline to give us some updates on the status of the Deadly Project and the resistance to it. Thank you both for joining. Would you mind sharing your names, pronouns, and location or other information that you'd like folks to know? Um, Hi, thanks for having us. Uh, My name is Toby. My pronouns are they, them, and I am currently on Monacan and Tudolo land in so-called West Virginia. Um, My name is Madeline. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm in Appalachian, Ohio, right on the West Virginia border. Madeline, thanks for joining us. Toby, welcome back. Let's see. So, um, Madeline, I understand that on January 29th, you were arrested for locking down to an MVP trail on Peters Mountain or around Peters Mountain. Can you talk a bit about what happened? Sure. Um, I mean, anyone who has a relationship with Peters Mountain or the land in that area knows how devastating it is for them to be drilling through that mountain. Uh, It's also pretty absurd. And I had the great privilege of spending the day on that mountain in the snow and the rain, um, mostly under a tarp locked to that drill. And it was beautiful watching the sunrise and two hawks were flying overhead. And then there were a lot of police and security and workers stuck in the mud. And it was interesting even to overhear the people were in opposition to complaining and grumbling under their breaths about the terrain. And it's something locals have been saying for a long time. And Appalachian people know that it does not make sense to be trying to punch these pipelines through these these areas. So it does feel beautiful to be up there and feel like the land knows better. I mean, we already know that, but to really kind of have it come home to us. So for me being there felt like a gift because of that. And the last time I was on Peter's Mountain, it's when my child, one of my younger child, who's seven now, was a, a babe in arms. And I hiked up the Appalachian Trail to go support the the tree sits that were happening at that time. And he was just in diapers and I camped out and just kind of like provided moral support, <laughs> shouted words of encouragement to the tree sitters. And it felt really uh, special to be able to come back and try to stop that drill for as long as I could. That's awesome. Roughly how long was the drill stopped for? I think we, st- I, I stopped that for an entire work day. So I think it was about eight hours. Hell yeah. That, that was probably really frustrating for both the locals and the people in the corporate office, as you as you mentioned, with the, like complaining about the car's terrain and everything. But in a public statement 
by you that showed up on the Appalachians Against Pipeline Facebook page. You talk about the inspiration gained from mothers and struggles to provide a clean drinking water and, and safety for, for children. On your website, yeah, 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 being MadelineFitch.com, Fitch with two Fs, uh, I found articles you'd written about you and your family resisting other pipeline projects. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, like you've already mentioned, at least showing up to offer support to folks that are engaged in certain types of struggle. And I wonder if you could just talk about some of your experience of struggling against extraction on Turtle Island and a bit of a bit of what motivates you and, and what sort of conversations you've had with other folks, like motivating other mothers or other parents, for instance, to engage in what could be like from uncomfortable to dangerous acts of eco-defense. Sure. I mean, I think that it's pretty clear to me in late stage capitalism and impending climate chaos that that's what's really uncomfortable and dangerous to families and to, to our children. And it was important to me to be in solidarity with other Appalachian families that have been fighting this pipeline for a really long time. Um, I'm close to several mothers and parents and families in Appalachia who, like our family does, drink from a spring. Our family lives 200 feet from a pipeline that was proposed to have to be repurposed for high pressure fracked gas. And luckily, people from all over the region on all ends of the pipeline fought really hard against that. And we did too, people we didn't even know. And that project was stopped. So I know every day that I benefit from the, the, the fighting and stubbornness of a lot of other people who stand to lose a lot when these life-killing projects are pushed through to benefit a few rich people. So I think it's important for me to stand up and do whatever I can. And what I tell my kids is none of us can do everything, but we all have to do what we can. And that when we're together on this, we're stronger. I think everyone gets a little self-conscious when they read their quotes that they said. But so I wanted to make sure people didn't think, you know, that I was saying, that mothers are special in a way that in any way kind of cooperates or bolsters this notion of motherhood as this specialized thing that is especially white motherhood, like this kind of like pure, innocent, moral authority. I think what I more mean by motherhood as being like a place from which I fight is that I think it's very, very clear to me that in the U.S., white middle-class parenting is constantly under pressure to be defined as something private, individualized, atomized, and yeah, that's sort of that way of corroborating this middle-class narrative. Uh, And that really goes against common sense and actual um, practical ways of running family and community where we're all really interreliant, we're interdependent. And people all over the world know that. And people in Gaza know that right now. Um, It was really clear at Standing Rock. I think indigenous and native communities on Turtle Island that are at the forefront of fighting these infrastructure projects have understood this as a concern that's intergenerational and touches every part of the community. So it's actually very rare and very specific and I think pretty purposeful when uh, um, activism in the U.S. is considered to be the territory of young people in their 20s or people who are unattached or people who are white. Uh, I think that the actual global history and ongoing story of people fighting against these life-killing infrastructure projects that are pushing us deeper into climate chaos and disaster, that the people who are standing up against that are our families and communities and civil society. And it's really important that we all show that that's who we are, that that's who we are. And we're fighting against forces that don't care about children, don't care about families, don't care if we have clean water to drink, don't, cl- don't care if people are dying under rubble and families are get- having bombs dropped on them. They really don't care about that. So we need to be together and show who we are. And I think that it's a fantasy to believe that children and families are not on the front lines already. We're already on the front lines. And especially, you know, where we live, I live in the lowest income county in Ohio, in Southeast Ohio, and in Appalachia, People have been fighting back against the rich and powerful for basic livability. The industry calls our area a sacrifice zone. And the people on the forefront of that 
are intergenerational communities um, who've been fighting for such a long time just for the basics, for basic safety and survival. So how can we not see that, see a uh, commonality all over the world with people fighting struggles like that? I think that there's, it's no coincidence that as soon as the genocide started happening in Gaza, what we saw coming out of the pipeline fight against the Mountain Valley Pipeline in Appalachia was immediate solidarity, just unquestioning solidarity. Um, and I think it's because there's a common sense solidarity with civil society against uh, these powerful forces that really don't seem to care about everyday people. Yeah, absolutely. That's really well said. Toby, do you want to add anything? Any thoughts? Uh, I don't think I can really add anything to what Madeline was saying. That was incredible. And I thank you so much, Madeline, for sharing that. Just speaking to the like interconnectedness of our movements, and I think that something that I've like, f like found to be like true before, well before this is just like how, not just like our shared values and our shared like commitment to resist like all forms of oppression, all forms of violence against our communities, like binds us all together. At, but so do like the actual like people behind all the de death and destruction and violence and uh, like all of the things that are actually binding us together in more ways than one. It's not just that we like have that shared sense of like wanting to uh, like be in solidarity with each other and uh, both on a local level and on a global level. It's also that we're fighting the same people when it comes down to it. Like anytime that there is something evil going on in the world, anytime that there's oppression, anytime that there are bombs falling and rubble falling, there's like going to be someone profiting off of it every time there's a pipeline, someone is going to profit off of it. And those people are the same people. And they don't care about people on the ground. They don't care about frontline communities or any communities, to be honest. They just don't care. And it's nothing, like, we are nothing to them. And I think that that is something that is very daunting to think about, but also, like, is something that, at least for me, like, helps bolster our resistance in that we do care for each other and we are going to be the ones to care for both ourselves, but our communities and also uh, like each other's communities as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's well said by both of you. So Madeline's action fell within the date range of Days of Solidarity, a campaign that was being run against the MVP in multiple different places, anywhere people could show solidarity. I was wondering if you all had any insights into how folks near and far responded to that request for action, if there were any sort of highlights that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I can share a little bit about that call for action. So there was a call for actions across the world, probably more specifically on Turtle Island, just based off of like the banks and investors and companies behind the Mountain Valley pipeline. There was a call for people to respond to both the kind of like wave of repression hitting um, folks on the ground in Appalachia who are using direct action to fight the Mountain Valley Pipeline, as well as like this newest kind of cycle of construction. So there was a call put out to ask people to organize solidarity actions in their home communities. A lot of that was based off of this kind of feeling on the ground here in Appalachia that like, Things here feel kind of bleak, I have to be honest. You can't go anywhere in this region without seeing evidence of pipeline construction. From like almost every major road, you'll see the pipeline, you'll see the scars upon the earth, you'll see active machinery digging up like the hills and the mountains around you. You'll drive over like creeks and rivers where they've either drilled underneath or their failures at building this pipeline has like poisoned and polluted the waters, which locals and scientists and everyone with any logic in their brains have been telling them for years what happened and so they push through this pipeline and I think also just to give people like a sense like before May of 2023 and Mansion involvement in the debt ceiling bill like people in this area kind of thought that the fight against the Mountain Valley pipeline was going to succeed they didn't have their permits in for to complete their water crossings they didn't have their permits to go through the national forest which is where peter's mountain is where madeline's lockdown was they were doing poorly in the stock market 
And then Joe Manchin, one of uh, the West Virginia legislators, like literally leveraged an entire global socioeconomic crisis to get this pipeline built. And part of the debt ceiling bill was saying that Mountain Valley Pipeline would get all the remaining permits and that none of those permits and none of the other kind of regulatory methods for uh, limiting construction and limiting this destruction could work. Basically saying you can't sue the Mountain Valley Pipeline in court, saying you can't like challenge any of their permits, you can't point to all of their numerous violations and say that they need to stop construction. And basically what that means is that leaves direct action to stop it. It kind of leaves people both on the ground to stop it, but also people all across the country to stop the forces that are contributing to the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So just that's like kind of like the setting for like this call to action uh, is asking people everywhere to help take up the fight and to help make sure that the companies and the banks who don't have to deal with this destruction on a day to day basis, they don't have to look out their windows and see like the mountain getting blown apart. They don't have to hear the excavators uh, moving dirt at all hours of the day and night. They don't have to hear the drills going underneath water, like the water bodies and the mountains. They don't have to deal with like what they are actually doing and like bringing the fight to them because they get to wash their hands of it because they're not here. None of the companies that are behind this pipeline are actually based in Appalachia and they never have to bear the consequences of what they're doing to communities and the land down here. Also, part of this call to action was really to have people show solidarity with folks who are facing a lot of repression. I can talk about this more, but folks on the ground who are taking direct action are like receiving trumped up charges, lots of like kind of bullshit felonies that are threats against people. They're fear tactics. They're trying to scare people away from doing actions. There is the increased threat of jail time. In fact, someone who locked down to a drill in West Virginia is currently um, serving two months in jail up in Northern West Virginia right now for uh, his action for like being guilty of one misdemeanor. He, uh, Jerome is serving one month in jail. There a are granddad three... too, just, yeah. just yeah. like a local granddad. A local granddad. He locked down to the drill on the Elk River, which is the same river that the West Virginia water crisis polluted. He uh, locked down to the drill that was going underneath the Elk River, and now he's serving two months in jail. There are also eight different slap suits that people are on, and uh, that those slap suits are in West Virginia, they're in Virginia, they are in federal court and state court. So basically, sorry to give all of this like uh, exposition, but this is all to say that the fight here is feeling very dire. And like the situation feels very bleak and part of that's like setting the stage for this call to action. I think that we saw on just like a lot of people over the that week, like throw down all across the country. Not only were there two lockdowns here in Appalachia, Madeline's and then also Mama Jules, who locked down to a helicopter just like two days later in a different site. Yeah, that was badass. Yeah, it's so cool. Uh, there are also like noise demos and banner drops at like the EQT headquarters and PNC headquarters in Pittsburgh. There were noise demos and demonstrations at the Wells Fargo headquarters in San Francisco, at the WGL headquarters in DC. You know, shout out to some of the groups like Third Act who literally like put on so many noise dem demonstrations that people like lost count in like New Haven and Sacramento and Richmond and Blacksburg. And then I think the thing that I also like want to point out is that you saw a lot of banners and we pasting on lockouts that all linked together a lot of different fights so like pointing out that like the same banks are behind mvp as behind like as they are behind cop city they're also the same banks that are funding like the genocidal uh regime and uh of israel and the genocide that's happening in palestine and so there were a lot of actions across the country that like highlighted that connection between our movements as well yeah, that's super inspirational. Madeline, did you have anything you wanted to throw into in addition? Well, I just want to highlight what Toby was saying at the beginning um, about how this pipeline was pushed through. I think some of us who really pay attention to these nitty gritty details of how the, the projects keep 
happening, no matter how bad we're fighting them, we can get really into the details and then outside observers get a little bit, you know, your eyes can glaze over at so many details. And I think what's important about MVP specifically, and I think one reason why people showed up in solidarity so much around Turtle Island and beyond, you know, what, on the one hand, people might think, why do we care so much about one pipeline in Appalachia? Why are people in California showing up about this? And I think it's really important to underscore and emphasize what Toby was saying, that this pipeline has been pushed through in a way that should be of major concern to anybody who is watching. Uh, it's a, it's weird to say this on a, you know, I, I know that probably all of us have our own feelings about the word democracy, but anyone who says they're concerned about the health of democracy and watching the way that this particular pipeline was pushed through, a national climate activist who kind of is more looking at things on a policy level was said to me, yeah, it's just, it's at the point where new fossil fuel infrastructure can only, only be pushed through if it's directly undermining the processes the democratic processes that a lot of us have already lost faith in, you know, and I think it's an interesting place to be to hold both of these things to be true at the same time, right? Like, I don't think any pipeline should be happening. Um, and I think that the policies and the laws are always set up to promote private interests over everyday people. Uh, and I also think even within the context of the way this kind of thing usually happens, we're seeing an escalation of the ways that these projects are just, even by their own metrics, you know, this pipeline is, was dead in the water. It was completely caught up in lawsuits. It didn't have all its permits. People thought we'd won. People in Appalachia were celebrating. So they can't play it straight and get these projects through anymore. That's not happening anymore. The only way they can do it is to just turn the whole table over and say, oh, actually, all those things we said mattered. All, that, all those laws that we said mattered, all the regulatory challenges that we said would matter, actually none of it matters and now they just can do it. So, you know, a lot of us have had a major lack of faith in those structures for a long time anyway, but I think that, no pun intended, this is the final straw for a lot of new people kind of like newer to that way of thinking. Like they'll tell you again and again what to do to fight in a civil way, to fight these projects in what they would describe as a civil way. Uh, that there's proper channels to go through. So those of us who've been trying to fight the Dakota Access Pipeline or fight Line 3 in northern Minnesota, you know, we know, we know that they're going to kind of put us through this dog and pony show and then we have to do exhaust all the administrative remedies. But I think that the fight to stop MVP and the way that this pipeline has come about is just showing in this kind of undeniable way what a joke all of that is and how in the end, it's really up to us. We have each other and we kind of have to do things the old fashioned way. And I think it's inspiring to people too that, you know, in Appalachia in rural communities, um, in places where people are kind of like used to getting together and doing things on their own, um, people are just rolling up their sleeves and saying like, if you're going to try to push this through, we're going to stop it in whatever way we can. And there's something really beautiful and really inspiring about that to people. And I think also, yeah, this sort of desperation of all of these powers that Toby is pointing to, a lot of them are the same investors, it's the same money, and they're afraid, they're on their heels, and um, they can't even do things in the old way that they used to. They have to just be more and more out about how dishonest and bankrupt, ethically bankrupt. I wish they were more bank, but a lot of times they actually are kind of bankrupt. That's the other thing. It's like hard to even know where the money is that they say is going to be, where the jobs are that they say they're going to It's all just a lie. And then it just falls to everyday people to really just have to stand up for what's important and what's really practically important, which is like what I was saying before, this livability and thriveability and um, not all of this these profits for the very few. And um, I just want to say on a regional note, it reminds me one time as a writer, I was on a, a panel of other Appalachian writers in Boston. And I think about all this, this all the time. It was packed. It was like packed to the gills. And all of these people from outside of Appalachia, they just wanted to know. They wanted to kind of like know, I think it had to do with Trump. Like, what what's making people tick what why are appalachians <laughs> the way they are you know they want to know about why did like, you do this to us yeah <laughs> what and i remember this one guy this one you know sweater vest wearing person <laughs> older white guy uh in the q a said 
I just don't understand why people vote against their own interests. That was one thing. And also, how can we convince these basically like poor country people to uh, trust the government? Why don't they trust the government? And, you know, he asked the wrong person. I don't know what he thought I was going to say, but I think it's 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 an incredible thing to ask people in a part of the world that has been used as a sacrifice and considered totally disposable. Why would anybody with any common sense anywhere trust the government? That's really not anyone's role. At the very least, people should be skeptical. But in this particular region, there's a long tradition of being highly skeptical of authority, of outside experts, of people who say they know best, um, and of people who have no connection to the land. And I think that um, it's really been beautiful to see the building solidarity between Appalachian people and indigenous people from other parts of Turtle Island coming together in, in this part of the, the world to move from more of a place of a, of a land logic and also of a storied distrust of state and powerful interests. I think that that is a major place that people fight from. Um, and I think it is kind of uncharted by like mainstream narratives about um, political orientations. In the US, I find it to be a very bracing and energizing, refreshing, and frankly, noble common sense um, community to fight in. Hell yeah. As resistance ramps up, so does repression. Toby already, actually, both of you talked a little bit about Jerome Wagner, who's catching the, the two months in jail. But can you talk about folks catching cases and what sort of asks there are for support? Like, Madeline, what sort of um, legal repercussions are you facing at this point for your direct action? I'm really just in the middle of all of this, and I feel like any platform I have right now, I'm using more to call for support for people who are facing more specific repression right now across so many movements. But I did, I thought about that question um, and how best to answer it. And I mean, I think it's really goes, Toby said it, hopefully can, can say more on it. But I think that there's a reason that you see so much solidarity. There's many reasons. But one of the things is in the face of all of the state repression, if anybody thinks that the repression happening in Atlanta is not going to be impacting the repression that people in Appalachia are facing. And Toby, I want you to say what we were just discussing before the, the podcast. You had a lot of other examples, but I think that anyone who's really paying attention notices that this repression impacts all of us and the, the powers that are behind that level of repression, they don't see the edges of different campaigns or struggles, you know, they they are coming for everybody. And so we do have to really find solidarity and stand together together on this. Yeah, I think, as Madeline is saying, there is a wave of repression going on right now that it's not just targeting folks here in Appalachia, like it's targeting folks down in Atlanta, there are subpoenas coming out around the no dapple fight bail funds around the country are being targeted. Like Virginia is trying to make it illegal to have a bail fund, as is Georgia. Uh, there are new crackdowns about all of the pro-Palestine protests going on right now. Like we are seeing that like empire is trying to go th through desperate measures to protect itself and to keep itself afloat. And it's failing because so many people on so many fronts are fighting back and are in solidarity with each other and are like pushing it back against kind of like the status quo as well as there are all of these like wild <laughs> projects that people are resisting and like all of this uh, pressure that people are are like organizing to stop. And so I think that as people fight back, as people like organize and mobilize and are vocal and like disciplined about their resistance, you're, we're probably all going to see in the near future just like this continuing wave of repression. And yeah, it's targeting people down in Appalachia. Like we are seeing people who for simple lockdowns, things that a year or two years ago would result in misdemeanors, people are catching felony charges. They're catching felony abduction and felony theft. We're seeing things like people who are arrested, charged, bailed out, and then re-arrested on new felonies and on new charges, like at their arraignments. There are like multiple cases where prosecutors and judges in both Virginia and West Virginia 
are saying that they are trying to seek jail time and like serious jail time. Not only that, people are seeing like wild veils, like Mama Jules's action uh, during this day of solidarity. One person got a, a $25,000 bail for one misdemeanor in Virginia. And the other person also for one misdemeanor, $10,000 bails. Like that is like obviously punitive. It is obviously like the state coming after people for fighting this pipeline in a way that is incredibly blatant and is like very much a scare tactic. And it's also something that this movement against the MVP hasn't seen as much. Uh, uh, like there have definitely been instances of the state coming after people of the state, like using denying bail as like a punitive measure because that is like the state is allowed to do that, especially in Virginia. There have definitely been instances where people have gotten felony or like been charged with felonies in the past, but we've never seen this like widespread like extra, like targeting of every single person and like ramping up of punitive measures for people who are doing like nonviolent direct action. Like they are like locking to equipment. It's not anything that is like in the past has produced this response from the state. You're also seeing, I think like a lot of movements are familiar with slap suits. A lot of people have like are familiar with what that means. People usually like com campaigns and movements have seen like one slap suit, but this is like we have eight slap suits in this region going on. Could you define a slap suit for folks that maybe haven't heard the term before? Yes, uh, it is slap stands for strategic lawsuit against public participation. It is a civil lawsuit that basically is kind of a way of linking a bunch of people who in one fight together. And it's really meant to like scare people away from participating in movements. So it is a way, the way that MVP is using it is that it is a threat against people who to take direct action that they might get added to this injunction, as well as people who support the MVP might there's also this underlying threat that they, even if they never lock down, even if they don't get arrested, they could still potentially get added to this injunction for their support, for their involvement, for them being vocal. It's like a scare tactic and a threat that basically companies really love to use as like a way of cooling resistance. And I think uh, in terms of like these kind of tactics that the state and the company are using right now, like the way that they are coming after people, the way that they are like having these looming lawsuits as threats against communities, against individuals. I think like now is the time that like it's really, really important to like keep organizing and keep mobilizing and to continue to be vocal. Like it's not the time to kind of withdraw because it's really scary. It's it's a time to like reach out. It's the time to organize with your communities and with your crews to really like push back against that kind of uh, scare tactics and fear tactics. And yeah, I think in other terms, like, direct on the ground response, like support that folks here in this region are asking for, there is like a legal defense fund that is supporting people who are going through bullshit legal situations as uh, well as there are opportunities to support folks who are going to jail. You can write to Jerome. I think Jerome is not the only person who has been sentenced to jail time, but I think is the only person who's currently incarcerated. And so there are ways of supporting folks who are like actively going through this repression and are being impacted by this repression, but in general, organizing crews and like doing solidarity actions or like thinking about how you can like fight back against that repression on an active level, as opposed to just like withdrawing and oppo as opposed to like being intimidated by those scare tactics, which is like really hard to do. Like it's, I say that as like, a, oh yeah, just like push fear away. Like that's totally easy to do. Like, no, that's not easy to do. It is terrifying. It is scary. Like scare tactics work because they're scary. Like fear is like a really common tactic to like kind of like repress a lot of movement. But I think that now the best like way to support folks who are going through that repression is to like think about how to like build resiliency in your own communities and also to uh, still show up for folks and still show up even when it gets to when like the stakes are way higher than they used to be. Yeah. And there's a link to the um, fundraising for legal support. I know on the AAP solidarity.org website, as well as information from that group about ways to get involved on the ground too. I wonder if, uh, I guess in closing, do y'all have any words of solidarity that you want to share further beyond 
the ones that you have with the folks involved in the struggle to defend the Wilani Forest and stop Cop City in Atlanta or any of the other cop cities that are threatening to rise up and be built around different parts of Turtle Island? I actually want to say something a little more about the carceral state and the people who are in jails not for stopping a pipeline and how that's related to the way we're seeing repression happening too. I also kind of want to keep in mind that when we see these waves of repression against justice activists and land defenders, there are a lot of kind of unseen and continued repression that sometimes are related or rise at the same time um, and in connected ways to communities that are around where that level of repression is happening. And I know that sometimes in direct action communities, we talk about like the real action starts when you're in jail um, and anybody who goes in jail for principled direct action and then spends their time in there thinking they're special or somehow the one who doesn't belong in there compared to everybody else who is in there that is somebody who I do not have affinity with. I think that anybody who spends any amount of time inside a jail or a prison with a heart or a mind uh, should come out an abolitionist. And I think that when I was just in jail, I just noticed that people were speaking really clearly in there about how, you know, my cellmate was saying, you know, there's more cops around and they're coming after homeless people. She'd been picked up for charging her phone late at night at a gas station and she'd been living on the streets for four years. They're not coming for the people who are uh, with all of the money and the power who are making it impossible to live in these regions. They're coming for poor people. And then they're also, when people like us are in there, we're coming out and we're using community bail funds to help people get out. Well, now they're trying to criminalize community bail funds. In the places that I go to jail, most people are in there because they can't, they don't have anyone to post bail for them. They don't have phone numbers memorized. They, there's no support for people getting out. They're getting bail denied for total bullshit. And they're in there for crimes of desperation and poverty for the most part. And women who are in there are grew up in foster care and their kids are in foster care. So uh, it's just a look directly at the way that the state has zero interest in doing anything except punishing people. That's what the state exists for. And they're going to be punishing us and they're going to be punishing people with a lot less resources and a lot less the support of community than movement community usually has. And, you know, it's all connected. I mean, even just the way that the oil and gas industry routinely hires ex-felons in a situation where people who are convicted of felonies have a really hard time finding employment and so are pushed into really predatory fields where they're likely to get injured um, and they are not going to talk about what they're witnessing or what's happening to them and there, where there are a few other options. I know that Mama Jules, before her action, has talked a lot about the way that man camps have impacted um, her community and then the rise in drugs and overdoses for people in Appalachian communities or something a lot of Appalachian locals talk about when they're opposing the pipeline. And then the wave of punishment and carceral approaches to people who are experiencing addiction um, and overdose in communities where I live in. That's what these police are doing. That's what the increase in carcerality is doing um, in these communities where we're seeing these projects be pushing through. Uh, and then meanwhile, the big companies are just getting glad handed, getting whatever they want. So I think that that's something we need to look at when we're talking about um, repression and the, the way that the state is really trying to crush everybody. Those are all really good points. And I think that, well, one thing that we saw out of the Atlanta folks is that people going in started making connections with and advocating, like using their platform on behalf of other folks that were in one of the deadliest prisons or deadliest jails on Turtle Island. And, you know, not just promoting themselves, but but doing that to build community and to expand movement and empathy and knowledge. And that is... I think the other side of what Toby was saying about repression and how it can be frightening, if we do it right, these sort of connections across generations and across geographical constraints can really blossom into a wider, oh, this is really bad mixed metaphors, but <laughs> like into a wider uh, sort of quilt of, of defense. Like if we build the, the projects that can do bail support or that can do post release support or that can attempt to like even cop watching or whatever mutual aid 
like all of these things, just like defending a few specific ecosystems from getting a pipeline is going to like spread out that defense to uh, not contributing towards global climate change, right? Or the rivers that are flowing down, you know, to the ocean and the pollution of the ocean and all the rivers along the way. Anyway, blathering. But I wonder. No, I think that is such a beautiful thing to say, and I would be remiss if I think we to bring into this conversation that, you know, it can feel like cold comfort to say we're in good company. But I know talking to people um, in Atlanta, and then hearing from people in Appalachia, and then remembering our history, you know, it it is it's on, on a practical level, you know it makes us stronger to remember our movement history, to remember that we are in good company, that people have been here before, to remember the green scare, to remember J20, to remember radical history before that, I think can be comforting and also can provide practical ideas and help us with our radical imaginations. And so I know that that's, those are some discussions that people have been having when we're, when we're facing repression. Not to say, oh, this has happened before, it's no big deal. But to say it is a big deal and there are people who we can talk to that we can take, have fellowship with, take comfort in the camaraderie of and talk about new ideas for uh, taking our chance and, and outmaneuvering. And radical people have always been good at finding openings and prying those openings open a little further. And I don't see any sign of us uh, stopping doing that. This is a stubborn community. Recalcitrant even. Go ahead, Toby. I think a final point for me is that kind of similarly, our movements are stronger when like we realize both like our shared power and our shared connections. But I think they're also made stronger going through these kind of things because it forces us to like, as Madeline's saying, like look back at shared history and also like imagine new futures together and imagine new ways of like building resilience and how in an ever-changing and ever more scary and scary world as like looming catastrophe is like on our horizon in so, on so many levels, like how we can survive it together and how we can build and be uh, there for each other. Madeline and Toby, thank you so much both for being here and taking the time and for the work that you do. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having us. You can learn more, including how to get involved and support the legal fund for folks struggling against the MVP at aapsolidarity.org or find Appalachians Against Pipelines on social media. And you can find some of Madeline's writings at madelineffitch.com. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. 65 people in the U.S. were killed in mass shootings in the month of June 2023. That same month, 105 people were killed by cops, according to an incomplete list compiled by the Washington Post. These are their names. Jordel Deshaun Richardson, William Barus Jr., Gabriel Matthew Wilson, Talama Casimir, Daniel Scott Meadows, Robert Dillard, Robert Francisco Gonzalez, Daniel Alvarado Aguilar, David Russell Sweet, Tyler Abel, Ryan Thomas Stanish, Anthony Allegrini Jr., Jack Semino Jr., Jeffrey G. Reeder, Bjorn Many Colors, Mauricio Sanchez Ramos, Jaden Durand Nixon, Brandon Scott Mills. Name withheld, June 5th, Harlan, Kentucky. Moises Tellez. Name withheld, June 6th, Deer Park, Texas. Brian D. Simonton. Calvin Keynes III. Nicholas Lendrum. Jordan A. Richardson. Jeffrey Neff. Antonio Lewis. Name withheld, June 7th, Conifer, Colorado. Lucius Benjamin Gibbs. Marcel T. Nelson. Kristen Fairchild. Christopher Wasili. Murdoch Jackson. Mackenzie DeBar. Roland Henry Hall. Joshua Taylor Haynes. 
Adam L. Timberlake. Name withheld, June 11th, Waco, Texas. Anthony John Carroll. Wendell H. Chastain. Anthony Worthy. Shella Bell Tusker. Alex Chase Lopez. James Dockery. Wayne Edwin Simmons. Name withheld, June 14th, Midway City, California. Name withheld, June 15th, Kaibito, Arizona. William S. Boardman. Name withheld, June 17th, Doral, Florida. Brandon Stein. Isaiah Martin. Augusta Moore. Boris Garcia. Obed Barba. Marquise Griffin Sr. Rodnishia Lenise Saunders. Danielle Marical Bell. Benjamin Chin. Mark Jaggers Jr. Kenneth Barber Jr. Daniel Johnson. Name withheld. June 19th, Mountain Hope, Texas. Cornelius S. Ball. Anthony Alfonso Sanchez III. Matthew Dillon Owens. Matthew T.J. Davis. Gregory Keith Rowland. Hercules Sharper, Jr. Daryl Austin Young. Mark Child. Graham Roberson, Hewlin Lee Howell, Nathaniel Filamani Taolai, Melissa Perez, Jeffrey Hare, name withheld, June 23rd, Meridian, Mississippi, Mark Peter, Peyton Wasson, Stephen Michael Brucker, Jarvian Hudspeth, Carl S. Gist, Ramon O. Morphin, Belinda Prim, Daniel Barnes, Jason Lansdowne, Matthew Heller, Juan Reynoso. Name withheld, June 28th, Gila River Indian Community, Arizona. Michael Edward Meadows, Kevin McDonald, Ronnie Tyler Parker, Richard Albert Stutes, Jr., Charles Vincent Todd, Jr., LaQuincy Dartez Ward, Daryl Gamble, James Allen Tabbitt, Jeremiah Salyards, Isaias Javez Garcia, Tyler Kennedy Deal, Ramon Martinez, Ernesto Ruiz, Gregory Ray Cribb, Leonidas Tamanini, name withheld, June 30th, Stonewall, Mississippi, Raul Mendez. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org this is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. 
Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop. 